Hello, and welcome to Virtual Victorian Days. My name is Sandy Roberts, and I'm your steampunk science teacher for today. I am a STEM educator with my company, Kaleidoscope Enrichment, so I do all kinds of science, technology, engineering, math, art, crafts, uh, all kinds of programs all over the area. I am also the Makerspace Coordinator for the Warren County Library System, so I do coding and 3D printing and sewing and just about anything else you can imagine. I love making new things. I love understanding how things work. I love being curious and exploring our world. And I hope that you do too, because then you're my kind of person. Now, we're going to have some fun today. Um, I did some programs yesterday. We're doing some programs today. If you just can't get enough of this, make sure you check out my website where you can find all the different things I'm doing in the area. Um, a lot of them right now are online, so you don't even need to be near Blairstown or Belvedere. You can still join in with us online. Um, and if that's not enough, my book, the big book of Maker Camp Projects with McGraw Hill um, is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and it's got over a hundred different projects for you to explore and have fun, including how to make fun cosplay items like this. Okay, so today we're talking about Victorian animation. And it's one of my favorite topics because even, um, even at home, even with just basic paper, you can make basic animations. So what is animation? Basically, an animation is when you take something that isn't moving and trick the eye into making it think it is moving. Now, obviously we do this with all kinds of fancy computers and CGI now, but way back in the Victorian era, they were just coming to understand the idea of animation. Up until then, they pretty much had little shadow puppets and things like that that they can make move around with them, their own power of their hands. Um, but when the idea of persistence of vision was discovered, it revolutionized how Victorians, how scientists and how creative folks were able to make new entertainment. Um, and the idea of persistence of vision is pretty simple. Okay. I'm going back to my Mr. Wizard from the 80s for the parents out there that remember that. When you see an item, what's actually happening is the light is hitting that object and some of the light is bouncing off of it and going into your eye. That light hits your retina and from there it's translated through your optic nerve up to your brain and your brain interprets it as an image. It'll also interpret color and all of those sorts of things. So some amount of light is bouncing off of this item and going into your eye. And it takes about one tenth of a second for that to happen, for the light to bounce off this object, hit your retina, up to your brain. So, persistence of vision is the idea that that image, while it's processing, if you substitute another image quickly enough, those two images kind of overlay each other and trick your eye into seeing both at the same time. This is the basic premise of how animation works. It's one of the foundational ideas. This is one of the simplest ways to explore it. It's called a thaumaturg, and we're gonna talk more about this in a little bit. We're gonna make one too, using some templates from my website. But the idea is very simple. We have a man on one side and a frame on the other. And if we spin them fast enough, let's see if I can do this. If we spin them fast enough, we should be able to trick our eye into seeing the man in the frame. And that's basically all it is. But we've come up with all kinds of great technology over the years to take that very simple concept and make it much smoother and more interesting and more seamless and colorful and all of those things. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the technology. I'm gonna show you some fun projects that you can make yourself to explore some Victorian animation. And um, I hope that you are inspired to create your own inventions. All right, we're ready to get started. Great, let's go. Okay, so let's learn a little bit about Victorian animation. Um, we're gonna start with the very basics. Magic lanterns. Now these are based on the simple premise of old shadow puppets. And maybe you've done this where you make like hand shapes, you know, and like that, and that's a butterfly, um, that sort of thing. So if you've ever done that and like done that uh, behind a sheet with a light coming from behind, you've kind of played with this idea. And for a long time, that was basically, that was what animation was. And then eventually people started making little shapes like this that you could have behind your curtain, shining a light from behind, and you got kind of a silhouette. Um, as you started making them poseable and moving, okay, that added a whole nother dimension because your creation could move. 
Now, the magic lantern idea um, is kind of your straight up ancestor to the modern motion picture film style projector. And what they did is they had jointed figures like this, but they were attached to cans and levers and rods and things like that. Light was set from behind and a screen in front. And as you turned a crank, the creature or, you know, figure moved and this created an animated sequence. Um, the first ones were actually really cute little monkeys, which you can actually see here and acrobats and things like that. Um, so that was the very first kind of projected animated image. It was called the Magic Lantern. It was very, very popular um, as an idea. So you can do the very same thing yourself, make your own little uh, shadow puppets and just get a sheet and a light and you can have a lot of fun with that idea. Now, I mentioned the Thamatrope before, right? Our Thamatrope right here. These came out in um, 1825, um, first published by W. Phillips, and they became a really popular toy. Uh, as you can see from the picture here, there you would buy a box of like dozens of different little Thamatropes and kids would just spend a whole lot of time, um, you know, sharing the images with one another. Of course, more creative folks would create their own Thamatropes. Uh, so it was just a basic little cardboard disc or wooden disc that when it twirled, it blended those two images because of persistence of vision. Um, so that was kind of the next step. Now from there, we started getting a lot more mechanical. Okay, I have trouble pronouncing this every time. <sighs> the the neck, can this go, I can't do it. I, I even listened over and over again. The point is, it was invented by a Belgian inventor, um, Joseph Plateau, and also at the same time, right around the same time, um, an Austrian invention uh, inventor named um, Stampfer. So they both kind of came up with the same idea. And the way that this device works is you have an image, okay? And in this case, you can see it's a horse image and the whole thing spins. Now you can see their, their version is much fancier and nicer and colorized, but this is a printout one I'm gonna share with you. And you would hold this in front of your face and look into a mirror. And you would look through the little slits, if you could see there are slits. And as you did that, you would get the um, moving image. You would see the animated image. So you probably can see it. I can't see it because I'm not looking directly on it. But you would hold this up, you'd look into a mirror, look through those little um, slits, and there you go, you'd get that image. This was a very popular toy too. Um, and you could buy, you would have like the whole handle set up and then you could buy many different discs. There are ones that were set up with uh, lights and lamps and all kinds of different things. So this became incredibly popular. It's still popular today, it's a fun concept. But it gave rise to probably my personal favorite. I don't know why it's my favorite, but it just is the Zotrope. Okay, the Zotrope, I have a couple different versions. You can get this one pretty inexpensively. And here's what's really neat. Basically you have, um, and here's the one I'm gonna show you how to make. Okay, so instead of, you, have, you don't have to look into a mirror with this. You look to the side through the slits and as you spin it, okay? And I'll have to see if I can do a close up, but as you spin it, you can actually see the, um, images animate. And so this one is a little different. Okay, it spins much faster. But what's cool about this and what made it so popular is that to change the animation, all you have to do is change the little strip that goes inside your Zotro. So you could buy tons of these. I mean, you could just very inexpensively, they're just strips of paper. You could draw your own, very fun way to spend an afternoon if you're you know, more artistic. Um, but you could create all kinds of different animations with just one little device. So these became very popular. Um, this was invented in 1865 uh, and you know, it basically became commercially available and kids just love them. So you can put out um, different strips for holidays. You know, you can put out birthday strips. It became very commercially uh, successful. Um, and that idea, okay, and this is a fun one. I'll do a close up for you in a bit. That led to, um, <laughs> well, that combined with this one, the kinograph, okay, from 1868. I know that sounds really fancy, but really it's a flip book, 
okay? Basically, you take different images with paper, you bind them together on one end, and you just flip the pages. You've probably seen this before or tried this, and I'm gonna, again, share one that you can make. But the idea is just that you flip through those pages and you're able to see the image. You can buy these at places still. They sell them all over the place. Um, when I was in North Carolina not too long ago, you could buy one that was all kinds of marine life. My kids thought that was the best thing in the world. Um, so these are really easy to make. And again, if you're someone who's artistic, you can draw your own and have a really great time trading flip books. These, because they were so inexpensive, you could sell them anywhere. They're very easy to carry. You know, you know, we have the equivalent of the iPad in the back of the car when you're on a long road trip with mom and dad. Well, these were kind of the equivalent for the Victorian age if you had to travel. They could keep the kids busy and they were very easy to store and to travel with. So very popular animation. Believe it or not, even though it's not as technical as some of the other things we talk about, early animators credit this simple type of flipbook, the kinograph, as what gave them the idea for film animation later on. So what I like about the story of this particular item is that you don't need anything fancy. It doesn't have to be really high tech. It just has to be a good idea that people can embrace and use and make new things with. And that sometimes is what you need to really spawn innovation. So I think that's a pretty cool thing. All right, that brings us on to the Praxinscope. Okay, this is just like the Zoetrope, except instead of having to look through slits, there was mirrors mounted on the inside. So the whole thing spun, as you can see, the whole thing spun, same type of thing, you could replace the strips of paper, but all you had to do was look at the mirror on the inside, and it was very easy to see. Now, you could put this on a crank, so that made it very easy to use uh, and to use for a long period of time. Uh, people made, people got them very fancy. They had like uh, lamps on top of them, so they were well lit. These became really popular in parlors, not just for children, but for adults too. So this was kind of like animation going from toy to something you might have in your parlor and share at a party with others. Now, Renal, you really have to give credit to. Uh, this was what he came up with in 1876. By 1882, I believe, he had come up with a projection version where he figured out that if he used light reflected off of those mirrors, he could project the image from his praxiscope onto a wall. Guess what? That's the first movie projector, right? That's it. It was a hit. People thought this was the greatest. This then, um, he figured out that he could make a background, like a static background, a picture or a poster or a painting and put it up on a wall and then project characters as if they were moving on that background. That was the big, big breakthrough. That was the big idea that got people thinking, oh, we can make really complex scenes now. And it doesn't just have to be one little strip. Well, eventually Renaud um, came up with the theater uh, uh, opaque take, I don't spell, I don't speak French. It's basically the opaque theater, um, the object theater. So what he did is, you could see this, I mean, this is pretty complicated, but he figured out that with many more mirrors, with lights done the right way, he could project various images. And you might have several of these going at the same time with different images. And he figured out that he could do backgrounds that way. And by layering these projected lights onto a wall, he was able to animate the first films. Now these were silent films, they didn't have soundtracks yet. But um, basically by uh, 1892, he was doing this commercially. And he gave over, what do I have here? 12,000, almost 13,000 shows between 1892 and 1900, just in eight years. Over 500,000 people came to his uh, theater in Paris to see this amazing new technology and that that was the big innovation that moved us towards what eventually became film animation and then eventually CGTI. Now I could go into all of that, but I really want to stick to our Victorian era and that we're kind of moving out of that. But really the Victorians are the ones that came up with the idea of animation as entertainment and truly embraced the idea of film. I have a short clip I want to share with you from, um, his first movie in Paris.
So that was just a 30 second clip. You can actually find a lot of these old films uh, online for free if you want to go and check them out. Wikipedia has a whole selection of them. So I really recommend go and check it out. See some of these early films. They seem really simple, but at the time they were the height of technology. So that's our introduction to Victorian animation. Now we're going to make a couple of these items so you can explore yourself and learn to make your own Victorian animation. Okay, I'm going to show you how to make a simple thaumaturgue. This is the, pamp uh, the uh, template that you can get from my website. Um, and I'll also put it on the event. And all you're going to need is this template, a pair of scissors, a hole punch or a pencil to poke a hole. You're going to need a bit of tape. And where did I put my string? some string or yarn, okay? So all you're gonna do is cut out all around the outside on the solid lines. Just gonna do this really quickly, very simple. I printed this on heavier cardstock paper. So you may wanna consider if you're printing it on regular copy paper, you might wanna glue it down onto like a cereal box or a file folder or something like that, like a manila folder, just to give it a little extra weight if you don't happen to have cardstock around. I find it works a little better. It lasts a little longer that way. Now I'll also put up a blank one so that you can enjoy making your own thamatrope. Um, it's really fun. And there are other templates out there, of course. There are some classics like um, the bird in a cage is, is a classic one from the Victorian era. Um, but I, I actually, I don't know. I really like the thamatrope. Um, so I have on many occasions made little thamatropes uh, for friends and for events. And so one of the fun things that you can do is take somebody's photo and put it in there and then put like happy birthday on the other side and make them a little optical illusion for their birthday. Um, you know, you may as well use your creative nerd and make something special, right? I don't think anybody else is going to show up with a thamatrope, a customized thamatrope for a friend for a birthday. Okay, it's not going to cut out. All you're going to do is fold on that dotted line, right like that. Okay, fold it in half and line it up nicely. I like to take a bit of tape and reinforce my edges there. A little bit of invisible tape. Now you can get away without using the tape. I mean, honestly, it's not a requirement, but I do find it makes it a little stronger. Oh, accidentally cut too much off there. Fix that. A little more tape. Tape fixes a lot of problems, doesn't it? Especially duct tape. That's my favorite. Okay, fold that over. There we go. All better, as if it never happened. Okay. Uh, there we go. Now I'm just gonna punch a hole where the two dots are. Easy as that. And again, if you have a pencil, you can just do that. Then I'm gonna make, I think I did, yeah. You wanna get about 12 inches of string Okay, so how long did I do for the last one? Oh, sorry. I did about two feet for each side. And really, it's up to you. You might find that you like it to be a little shorter. You might like it a little longer. Too much string, though, gets really challenging. So I cut um, two feet of string, so I end up with folded over. And I just tie it off. And part of this is you just want something a little stronger. So I just tie it like that. I'm going to measure a second one because you're going to need two, and you want them to be about the same. So try to be kind of careful about that. Um, the other thing is if you have like cotton string or twine, you could try using that. Yarn does have a lot of give to it, which I personally prefer, but you may find that you prefer a different material and that's fine. So all I'm going to do now is take the loops of my yarn through the hole like this and through like that. Ta-da! and up and in, like that, and there you go. Now you have your Samatrope. So all you're going to do is spin it, and you get really good at this after you've done it for a while. And let's see, ta-da, the man's in the frame, all because of persistence of vision. Now, 
Let's see if I can show you. This is the zoetrope. This is one of my other favorites. Let's see if I can catch on camera. I'm kind of trying to see if I can catch on camera. Very, maybe, can I get the right angle? It's kind of hard to do. Maybe if I hold it up closer. <laughs> Filming this is very tough in the setup I have, which is to say an old camera from my college days. There you go, you can see it. Did you see that? See the lizard? See how he's moving? Can you see him? <laughs> Pretty cool, right? So to make your own zoetrope, and again, I'm going to put the template and instructions up. What you're going to need is the template. Okay. And you can see, basically you just cut it out and fold it over and tape it together. Mine's getting kind of beat up here. Okay, so you're gonna make a circle out of the template with the cylinder, okay, and the little slit. Then you're gonna tape it onto an old CD, okay, with just, I used a little bit of clear tape, whatever you've got, okay. Then I took a little piece of cardboard over the circle in the center of the um, CD, and I just used some duct tape, but you could use invisible tape, whatever, just to seal that up, okay. And then I took a sharpened pencil and put it in there. And you get the same idea. You can kind of loosen it. There you go. We just spin it. Let's see if I can catch this one. Can I catch this one for you? Can I get a good angle? There we go. Let's see. It's, not, it's a little more wobbly than my store bought, but there you go. Okay, so it's a little wobbly. You kind of have to play with it, but it only takes a couple minutes to do. There you go. Did you see that? Ta da! <laughs> so you can experiment with that. All you need is a CD, little scrap cardboard, tape, the template that you print out. Again, I printed it onto cardstock, but paper will work too, and a pencil. Easy peasy to make your own little zoetrope. So I'll put that template up for you as well. And you know what the most fun thing is? I'll put a blank one up. So again, you can come up with your own creation for your own strip. Last one. Okay, this is the disc that we talked about that was kind of in between the thamoscope, this thamatrope and the zoetrope. Um, and this is the kind that spins. And this is very easy. All you do is you cut out your piece. Now you do need to use a craft knife to get these tiny little slits here. And then just a pin, a sewing pin, a bead, and right into the eraser of your pencil. Right, and let's see, can you see? Now, I would have to Wonder, no, let me, I don't have a mirror. I meant to grab a mirror. <laughs> so this one, you would look through the slit and you'd spin and you'd look for your shapes. So that's a really easy one to play with too. So you can make yourself a little collection here of different animation devices and see which one you like the best, make up your own patterns and become a Victorian animator. I will also throw up some shadow puppets because I think shadow puppets are really fun. I don't think shadow puppets should ever go out of style, especially when you make them the articulated kind. So I just used little brads um, or, you know, brass fasteners to make my little guy be able to move. And this makes it extra fun because they wiggle around and they have a lot of movement that way. So shadow puppets are a wonderful thing too. And I'll put up a set of shadow puppets for you to cut out as well and play with. So. That is some fun Victorian animation that you can experiment with and see what you come up with. Well, I hope that you enjoyed learning a little bit about Victorian animation and that you are going to go to the website and have some fun making your own items. Um, again, my name is Sandy Roberts. I am the owner of Kaleidoscope Enrichment and Makerspace Coordinator for the Warren County Library System. I love science and tech and engineering and making new things, and I would love to keep making things with you. So check out my website. Um, I've got a couple of other workshops I'm doing, so make sure that you stop in and come learn with me. Take care and enjoy virtual Victorian days. <laughs>